Greetings to you and welcome to session 47 on the Gospel of John. I'm Timothy Muse, lead pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio. It's a joy to be with you today as we spend this time together. Thank you for your continued investment in the work that we do, your continued investment in this Bible study and these sessions. If these sessions are really helpful for you, if they're really powerful for you, I would encourage you to share them out there. Uh, If you've connected to them through the social media sites on the church, Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, please go ahead and share them out so that others can participate in it, others can engage in them. It is really by this grassroots effort, by this organic effort that we're able to move the mission forward, move the words and the proclamation forward. So I ask you, I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to share those out there if you have Uh, If you have an opportunity, if you've connected through the social media sites, then please share them out there. If you're obviously you're connected into my YouTube page because everything filters into my YouTube page. If you're not subscribed to my YouTube page, please do that. Please subscribe. And and again, send it out there. Share it, like it, whatever, whatever form you can indicate that this is helpful for you. It will then help others see that it can be helpful for them. That's how this works. That's how this process moves forward. So I, I certainly would encourage that. I would encourage you to do that. So I I certainly would encourage you to take those opportunities, uh, share it out there, tag me, and I'd love to see where you are. I'd love to see where you're connecting from and where you're connecting to. That would be awesome. So share it out there, tag me in it, please, and um, tag the church in it. Uh, Again, this is the church's Bible study. I'm doing it, but this is the church's offering. So Get it out there. If you're a member of the church, then please, if you see it on your on your um, timeline or on your feed, then share it out there uh, for others to participate uh, and engage in. So thank you for that. And and like anything that the church offers, uh, get it out there, share it out there. That's the power of social media. That's the power of the interaction that we have together. If this is your first time with us, then welcome. Welcome to the sessions. Welcome to the series. I certainly would encourage you to keep going, keep moving forward. You don't have to step back from the sessions. You don't have to step back from the work because uh, it's a session, but it, you know, you're know you going to get a lot out of it. There are some things that I might refer to from previous sessions, but it's a standalone enough that you're going to get stuff out of it. Then I would encourage you to go back and you know, hear the other sessions. We've been walking through the Gospel of John now for almost a year. Uh, I'd have to go back and look and see when the first one was published. I know it took a couple of weeks off there around Christmas. So we're probably coming up about a year since we started this process. So there's a year's worth of of Bible study out there, and that's just on the Gospel of John. There's a year-long Bible study on Romans, a year-long Bible study on Revelation. Uh, there's a 16-part series on Nicene Creed, as well as uh, Foundations of the Lutheran Church. So there's a lot out there. There's a lot of content. There's a lot of pieces out there on my YouTube page. So I certainly would encourage you to take advantage of them. This is a more meant to be an MP3 format. Uh, You know, the other pieces are more talking head MP4 video format, but uh, different formats, different opportunities. Uh, This is a little easier for me to work with. It it, it offers me a little bit more um, opportunity to do what God is asking me to do. So that's why I do it. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, If you're returning, uh, then you know, if you're, return, if you're a returning listener, then thanks for coming back. Thanks for continuing to invest in this. Uh, it is important. It is important that we know the word, that we study the word, that we dwell in the word. And then out of that dwelling, we can go ahead and move forward. We can move forward with our growth and our understanding. So so thank you for being part of this, this work. Thank you for being part of this uh, journey that we're all on together, uh, this journey, the path of righteousness, this journey of faith, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but it really is. It's a journey more than a sprint. It's a, it's a, a, a way of, of, of moving forward. So uh, I would encourage you to have a Bible open before you always, uh, you know, when we study the word, have a Bible open before you. When we study the word of God, you want to have the word of God open. You want to be able to access it and read it. So you know what this word is all about. So, you know, what this word can do. Uh, We don't want to find ourselves in a position where, you know, we're confronted with the need to present the word, but we don't know it. We want to make sure that we know the word and we want to make sure that we're able to engage it. So have it open before you. Uh, John is the fourth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth gospel. 
uh, and there's the synoptics, the first three, and then uh, and then John. It doesn't matter what kind of translation or paraphrase you use. I use the New Revised Standard Version. You can use whatever version you want. You can use whatever language you want. There's nothing that says you can't read it in another language. Of course you can. All I ask is that you have it open before you so that you can engage in the word accordingly. Uh, so we are in the Gospel of John. We are in the 17th chapter now. We have moved almost to the end um, to, of the, we've moved almost to the end of the farewell discourse as Jesus knows it. And we are going to be coming to, um, what we know as the passion. And that starts in chapter 18. So we have one more chapter left to go in the farewell discourse and that's chapter 17. And that's where we're going to pick up. So Jesus now for what we know as four chapters, 13, 14, 15, and 16, starting with the last supper and the washing of feet all the way up to now, Jesus has been instructing his disciples about what's going to happen, about what their role is, about his leaving, you know, his relationship with God, all of these different things. Jesus has been sharing with them all these different things so that they're able to grasp what happens next. Because once, once Jesus is arrested... Once the action is set into place that we see here coming up very soon, it's going to happen very fast. And we know that. We know the story of of, of Good Friday, of Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. So this is kind of like late in the evening on Monday, Thursday, all right, before they leave, before the arrest. So, so um, it is, it, 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 it's going to happen very fast. So Jesus wants to make sure that when it happens, the disciples are fully prepared for what happens. So he's been talking to the disciples about where he's going. He's been talking to the disciples about their role in the world, their relationship with God, all of these different things. Uh, and and finally, Jesus comes to the, you know, to the disciples at the, the end of last session. You know, uh, Jesus talks about the hours coming. You know, it has come. Uh, it's going to be scattered. Everything's going to everything's going to fall apart. It looks like everything's going to look like it's doom and glo- gloom and gone, like some failed messianic promise. That's what it's all going to look like, but it's not really going to be. But it's going to look like that. So then we pick up in chapter seventeen, and chapter seventeen is really the final, uh, the final pieces of this. And what we're going to see is we're going to see Jesus openly talking to God openly talking to the father in a very now we're going to see it as a very formal way but but jesus is going to be be in a very conversational way now this is important keep in mind for all of the disciples lives as good jews you talk to the priest you took your stuff to the priest then the priest took his stuff to the other priest and then ultimately that priest for the priest of the month went into um uh, went into the Holy of Holies and took everything to God. Okay. So you didn't have access to God. You didn't have access to straight to the divine, but here's Jesus showing that access. He's showing that immediate access to God through his relationship. So he's showing the disciples their access to the father because they have access to him. I mean, he's been making it really clear that because they believe in him, they believe in the father because they know him. They know the father because their connection to Jesus is their connection to God. They may not be fully grasping the totality of God's role or the totality of Jesus place in the throne room, but that's what Jesus is trying to define for them. That's what he's trying to show for them is that to know him means to know God, to know Jesus means to know God. So Jesus is going to begin to literally show the nature of this relationship, the relationship that they will have to depend on, that they will need to depend on if they're going to move forward in in this work that they're called to do. So that's where we pick up um, in chapter 17. That's where we pick up moving forward here uh, is in this dialogue between Jesus and God. So after Jesus spoke these words, this is 17.1, after Jesus spoke these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom he, you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had in your presence before the world existed. Okay, so so now this is a very direct piece to, to God. Now, Jesus has just got done talking very plainly to the disciples about leaving, but not leaving alone, about, you know, going and coming, about the Holy Spirit, about the presence. So now Jesus is finalizing this. And, and 
I really think it's important for us to understand that this is not Jesus reminding God of the glory. This really is Jesus asking, but more so so that the disciples hear him ask than to assume that he's going to get it. He doesn't want to leave anybody out there assuming, oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is what he, he wants to be very clear. Jesus wants to be very clear. And so he is being very clear in this prayer. And he says, Father, the hours come Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you gave him. So glorify your son. And what is the glory of Christ? What is the glory of Christ? We want to think the resurrection. That's the glory of God. The glory of Christ is a cross. The hour has come. Glorify your son. Allow me to finish the work that I started. Allow me the glory that you have asked of me. Now think about this for a minute. Think about how tempting it would be even for God to lash out, respond. Here is the son, the Messiah, the perfect, the creator, the one who goes out. Here he is being crucified, being beaten and lied to by the very people he came to save. How tempting it would be. How, how well, it would be very human. Of course, we want to put that attribute on humans. We want to think that, you know, the capacity to tolerate that as a human is only so far. And so we put that in, on ourselves. God has a far higher capacity to tolerate. Um, injustice and, and, and unacceptable behavior than we do. But Jesus is saying, beloved father, let me do what you asked me to do. You know, it's all theoretical. It's all hypothetical until we're down into the moment. Now that we're down into the moment, God, let me do what you ask me to do. Let me be glorified so that I may glorify you. Let me be glorified in the cross. Let me take my place in the sacrifice. Let me take my place in the crucifixion so that you can have the glory of the resurrection, so that you can have the glory of life everlasting. But that glory is not going to come if you don't let me have the cross. Let me have the glory you have set before me to do. Again, and we need to remember, we need to remember all of this is orchestrated by God. This, there is no mistake here. Jesus does not fall into hard times. He doesn't get caught up in a loophole like Nebuchadnezzar did in the book of Daniel. Jesus has been marching to this and was fully aware that this was the probable outcome of his ministry before he began it, before he left his throne in the throne room of God's kingdom. Jesus was fully aware that this was a probable outcome for him. And as probable as it may be, it was all theoretical. It was all, hey, I mean, it could possibly happen, but that's like, let's not plan for the, for the worst. And certainly we don't want to plan for the worst, but here's Jesus getting ready to walk to the cross. And he is saying to God, let me do this. Let me have this. Yes, of course, you could in, a, in an instant snap out existence. Yes, of course, you could send down those legions of angels to wipe out the Romans and kill your people. You could do that if you really, really wanted to. But let me have the glory here so that you can have the glory of the resurrection. That's what he's asking God to do. That's what he's asking of God. You have given me all people since you have given him authority over all people, him being the son, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So the glory of eternal life comes through the cross. Look, you know, Jesus saying, look, God, you gave me the authority over all these people. Let me give them eternal life. Let me give them your name, but let me give them your glory and your glory comes in resurrection. So there is truly an end game to this story. And the end game to the story is the glory of Christ, which is the cross. He offers himself up as a sacrifice. And then the glory of God is the resurrection and eternal life is life in God's name. That's what it is. So everybody gets the glory, but Jesus has to take the cross in order for all the other glory to be enacted. This is step one. And so God has to allow the son to be taken to the cross. God has to allow the son to be beaten, threatened, tried crucified and risen from the dead. I mean, look, there's nothing to say that God has to wipe out the Romans or the Jews. I mean, look what, look what God did to uh, the Egyptians. I mean, God could have placed a couple of, of, of well-designed strokes or, you know, maybe a little bit of famine, maybe a little bit of plague and wiped out Pilate and Caiaphas and Annas and the, and the uh, Pharisees and the scribes. God could have done all that, but God didn't. 
God could have plucked Jesus out of the circumstance and made him disappear. I mean, how many other times did they look to arrest him and he slipped away because that because his time hadn't come? So Jesus is saying, God, the time has come. My time for glory has come. Let me do this. Let me do this and let me take my glory, which is the cross. Let me die so that you can have the glory of resurrection. Let me sacrifice so that you can have the glory of eternal life. That is where things are at. So, so that's what Jesus is saying. And, and, and look, you know, again, Jesus wants to be clear. Okay. So for one thing, Jesus has this open dialogue with God, but in another thing, Jesus wants the disciples to know this was not a mistake. This was not an accident. This is glory. This is what glory looks like. Now, not glory according to the world, not glory according to the earth, not glory according to humans. We don't, we don't participate in glory that way, but this is glory according to Christ. This is the glory of the Messiah. Let me do this. Let me do this since you've given me authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given me. And, and keep in mind, remember, Jesus talks about the, the authority of this world. He's talking about the devil. And he's saying that authority has been thrown down now. The authority of this world is given over to me. Eternal life rests in my hands. Damnation rests in my hands. The future of people's lives rest in my hands. Not the devil, not uh, anybody else, but me, my hands, my work, I'm the one who has control over all of this. So you've given it to me. So let me finish what I started. Let me finish this so that you can have the ultimate glory of eternal life. You can have the ultimate glory of giving people eternal life in your name. And that's what he says, you know, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent so that they may know you and that they may know me, both of us. That is the true nature of eternal life. Because once we truly know God and once we truly know Christ, then we have and then we have a place in God's life forever. That's how it works. Um, once we know God intimately, personally, completely, then we have eternal life. That is what we're striving for. So, so what does it mean to have eternal life? Is have a living relationship with the living God. And that living relationship with the living God comes through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It comes through knowing Jesus. That is where that that is where eternal life comes from. What does Jesus say earlier? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So if you want to know God, you need to know me. And if you want to get to God, you need to get to God through me. But once you know me, then you know the Father. And once you know the Father, then you have eternal life. Because once you know the Father, then you're going to be striving to live out eternal life. You're going to be striving to live out the life that I expect you to live in this world. Now, it's kind of fascinating because here's a little bit of um, here's a little bit of linguistic work, you know, because it says, you know, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus never speaks to him, speaks about himself as the Christ. Okay, He doesn't call himself that. Um, he speaks himself, speaks about himself in the third person, the son of man, you know, the son of God. Um, but he, he doesn't ever call himself Jesus Christ. And that's a moniker that's been given after his crucifixion and resurrection. Jesus, uh, Christ means the chosen one or the separated one or the Messiah. All right. So it's probably the linguistic work of uh, John, the writer of John, to add that because it probably said something along the lines. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the one true, the the only true God and me, your son or me or Jesus or something like that. I glorify you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. And the work that you gave me to do is to spread your word ultimately to death. I mean, Jesus is going to die for the word. That is the work that he has been called to do. Jesus is going to die for the mission because the mission will require his death. It does. The mission requires his death because the people aren't getting on board. The people aren't accepting it. They're not grasping it. So the mission requires Jesus to die. And that is the work that he has come to finish. As Jesus says, you know, um, I glorify you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. And the work that you gave me to do is to proclaim your word even unto death, even to the point where they kill me for it. And they're going to. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had in the presence 
in your presence before the world existed. So now that I've come to work, now that I've come to earth, now that I've done what you asked me to do, now that I'm finishing the work that you asked me to do, then draw me back to the place where I began, to the place of glory in your presence. So remember, so we're kind of bookending this now. Um, and we're saying that, remember in the beginning, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Nothing came into being without the word and the word became flesh and lived among us. So, so we're acknowledging in the, in the prologue, in the very beginning that this, this Jesus is the word made flesh. This Jesus is the word that was present at creation. Jesus is now verifying that in the final words of the discourse prior to his crucifixion by saying, you know, you know, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had in your presence before the world existed. Let me be the word that dwells next to you before the world existed. So so notice something here, and, and this is really important to notice, is that Jesus doesn't request the throne of judgment. He doesn't request to be the one to take the reins of judgment over the living and the dead. We believe him to be. We believe him to be the one that will judge the living and the dead, but he doesn't request that. That is given to him. What he's asking for is he is just asking to be returned to the place he was before it all began. It is God who updates it, who increases it and says, no, I'm going to give you more than just this place. I'm going to give you the power of judgment. I'm going to give you the power of the father, the creator. I'm going to let you be the one that does all of the judging that does all of the work so i'm going to let you expand beyond just the glory that you had when you left you're going to have more when you get back and that's what we understand we understand jesus was the word made flesh the creator but judgment was all in god the father's hands and then god the father gave the role of judgment to god the son um, to the one who died and rose from the dead. And so, so that's how this is working out here. That's where all of this comes from, this idea, this, this place. So we see that Jesus is, in fact, the one who was there at the beginning, will return to the Father. So when I return, put me back in the place of glory. Well, God's going to give him more than just a place of glory. God's going to give him um, the throne of judgment, which is far more than just the creative word. All right, so we're going to move on. Uh, so this is a big thought block here. Uh, we're going to break it up a little bit um, just so that it's a little easier to manage because I don't want to get too big um, and take on too much. So this is chapter This is uh, chapter 17. This is verse 6 and following. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on, my, on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I've, I've been glorified in them, and now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Okay. So, so Jesus is laying out again, this threefold relationship. I have made your name known to those you gave me. Uh, now, now again, I understand that everybody in, everybody in the world is God's God created everything. The, 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 the image of God is in everyone, but Jesus mission was to start the fire burning with a few, and then it would expand. Remember when Jesus is crucified, he's got 12 followers, 11, one of them had already committed suicide. Uh, so 11 followers. Uh, and, and so with that, being the case, um, you know, the mission starts out very small, but it is to expand. So Jesus says, look, I have made your name known to those you gave me from the world. This would be the disciples. This would be the women that follow Mary, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary and Martha, Salome. Uh, you know, the, these are the women that have followed along, that have been part of the ministry, that have received the word. And, and again, I know that we want to say that, well, you know, the women were not formal disciples, and it's not because Jesus didn't want them to be former disciples. But because they couldn't be and still and Jesus still have some kind of legitimacy in the world. Teachers in the ancient world didn't have female disciples, but these women followed and he taught them. He allowed them to stay in the midst of the conversation. Think Mary and Martha, you know, 
Um, Martha was in the kitchen doing the Martha thing, and, and Mary was at the feet of Jesus. He didn't send her away. He accepted her and allowed her to remain and learn. So Jesus was very open to female disciples, female followers, female learners. He They just were never called that because in the ancient world, you wouldn't have a female disciple. And and again, I, I you know, if, if you're hearing this and this is bothering you, I'm sorry, it bothers me too, but this is the way it is. I'm not making any judgment. I'm just giving you historical facts okay um i'm glad that it's better is it perfect no it will it ever be perfect i'd like to say yes but i doubt it um but what i'm saying is that this was the reality in the time and so with that being the reality of the time those whom jesus was given he says you know you've given them to me and i haven't and and i've given them your word they were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. So, so, so Jesus also wants to make clear, and I think this is a really important, um, a really important piece for us. And, and Luther really, you know, kind of like holds on to this when he talks about the, uh, the third article of the apostles creed, you know, notice that, that, that Jesus doesn't say they came to me and I love them because they figured me out. No, you gave them to me. You allowed them to come to me. You opened their hearts to me. It was by your gift that they're part of my kingdom. Well, and that's still the way it is. I mean, Luther would say, you know, we can't believe in Jesus Christ except through the Holy Spirit. We don't have an awakening by our own means or desires. You know, I've I've never, I, I, I always say that, you know, people who are living the good life and they're just moving along and everything's great. They don't just wake up one day and go, wow, you know what? I really want a God in my life who's going to tell me how to be morally and ethically right. No. No, people who have a God in their life, they either they were either shown that God by someone who lived out or they're like they were face down in the gutter, in some kind of gutter. And they needed something. They needed a God to to get them out of it. They needed a divine intervention. OK, so we get to Jesus because God intervenes in our life somehow. Me, I got to Jesus because God intervened in my parents life. God intervened in my parents life when I was um, when I was an infant. Okay, Uh, and so they brought me to Christ and I grew up following Christ because my parents intervened on my behalf. It was by the work of the Holy Spirit through them that I became a believer. Um, I didn't just wake up one day and go, wow, I really want a crucified and risen savior who, you know, does all these awesome things for me and changes water into wine. That's not how it works. That's not what it is. I was given it differently. I was given it because my parents decided that they were going to introduce me to Jesus. So it really, you know, and, and, and really, and this is important. This is an important thing for us to grasp because we really come across and we, we confront that whole idea of, you know, I choose Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. No, we don't do that. We don't choose Jesus. We choose sin. We choose pride. We choose humility, uh, uh, hubris. We choose arrogance. We choose our own way. It is not about us choosing Jesus. It is about God intervening in our life and showing us that following Jesus is far more important and far more beneficial than choosing our own brokenness and despair and pride. So the choice isn't that I choose Jesus. No, the choice is that God intervened in my life and I actually got it. And for me, God intervened in my life through my parents because they got it. So here we are. All right. So this is a really important concept. And it's an important concept that um, that the church in some ways does a really good job with. But in other ways, it really doesn't. And and we, we really need to strive to do a better job with this understanding of how things work and, 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 and what it works. But anyway, okay, so they were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. They have done what you have asked them to do. They have run the race to the end. They have followed me this far. Um, and they have. I mean, the disciples really came to that point. Now, uh, we all know that, that they're going to drop the ball, right? They're going to fail here, and it's okay. Uh, they're going to drop the ball. They're going to fail, and 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 then Christ is going to offer them peace, and they're going to move forward, and that's going to be an awesome and incredible thing. So in all of this, now they know that it's not just about me, but it's about you. Now they see the connection. Now they see that everything you have given me is from you. 
For the words that you gave to me, I gave to them, and they received them and know in truth that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. Okay, we really need to get this. Again, and, and for us, you know, post-resurrection, 2,000 years after the first Easter, it's a whole lot easier for us to dwell with this because we do not have generational separation between us and God, particularly Lutherans. I mean, if you're walking the Protestant uh, path, if you're listening to us from the Protestant path, um, then, then, then that separation has been brought down for 500 years. I mean, it's been 500 years of Lutheran theology that we've talked about the connection and that we've been connected to God and that, and that we know God and that, that we can go right to God. That's the whole foundation of our relationship. But you need to understand that these disciples, they have generational, not only experiential, but generational teaching that God is out there, that you don't go to God, that you don't connect with God, that God is that, you know, that, that, that crazy neighbor. Um, and that every time the ball goes in the crazy neighbors are, you just go buy a new ball because nobody wants to knock on the door because the crazy neighbor is going to like cut your head off or, you know, grind your bones for his bread or whatever, you know, I'm sorry, I'm channeling my inner Shrek here. Um, but you get it. Okay. So we have this understanding of the relationship of God and Jesus Christ that is very intimate and very connected, but the disciples didn't. They didn't. They had generational separation. Remember that the Bible, um, the Old Testament ends approximately 400 years before the proclamation of Jesus Christ. Okay. So when the Bible, when the last of the historical Bible ends, um, about 400 years before the birth of Christ, it's been 400 years, been 10 generations of God being separate and silent in a way. All right. So these guys have never known anything about a God of intimacy or closeness or connection. God doesn't speak to them. God speaks to the really, really important. And then the really, really important, if they are willing, will share a little bit of it enough to abuse them over it. I mean, let's be honest. You know, those who protect the temple cult were those who were abusing the word that God was giving them because it kept them in power. Power is an amazing thing. You know what? When someone has power and God speaks to them, they will they will manipulate the word to keep their own power. And that's what the that's what the the Pharisees and the scribes and the high priests. That's what they were doing. That's why the Messiah came, because if the temple cult was actually doing the work of God, then the crucifixion and resurrection wouldn't have been needed. But it was because the temple cult wasn't doing it right. Okay. So, so here is Jesus talking about this, 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 this threefold interaction, me to you, you to them, them to you, them to me, you know, and, and this trifecta that there is no way that the disciples could even begin to comprehend that this is actually happening, that they actually have access to God through Jesus. They haven't actually have access to God at all, but that's what Jesus is saying. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. So I'm not down here myself. I'm down here as a representation of you. I'm down here bringing what you have given to them. Okay. So this is, this is, this is me. I'm like the delivery boy bringing the pizza from the pizza oven to the table. All right. Um, it's not like the pizza's being out is is out in the street and you have to watch somebody else eat it. So this is a very intimate thing. And again, for us, it's really easy to grasp, but not for the disciples. So that's why Jesus um, is saying this. And he goes on to say, look, I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me because they are yours. So this isn't a so so the mission the mission has a world connotation a world changing connotation but it's got to begin with the disciples it's got to begin with the few you know so Jesus says I'm not asking on behalf of the world I'm asking on behalf of those who are here I'm asking on behalf of of the ones you've given me because it's them that the mission is going to stand on it's them that need the holy spirit it's not the whole world that needs the holy spirit well the whole world needs the holy spirit but for most of the world if the holy spirit can't shows up they're not going to be able to figure it out they're not going to know what the holy spirit does so they so I need to do something else um, I'm asking you to be with them because if you're with them, then they're going to spread it. So I'm asking on their behalf, not behalf of the world. I'm asking so that they know that I'm talking to you and you're listening. All right. And I'm asking so that they know that I'm going to the father, the maker of heaven and earth, and I'm coming in and I'm asking you to be part of them. All mine are yours and yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. So we're all one. Okay. The hierarchy isn't there anymore. 
All right, well, we're just coming past uh, Trinity Sunday. So Trinity Sunday is just behind us. So if you're listening to this, um, you know, years later, decades later, who knows, however later, you know, Trinity Sunday 2023 is the Sunday right before this episode. Um, so so this, this whole, you know, kind of triune God, triune understanding, equal equal parts, separate parts. Well, in a lot of ways, Jesus is laying this out in, in a very similar way. Mine are yours, yours are mine, I'm in you, you're in me, you're in them, I'm in them, you know, yada, yada, yada. It's, it's, so Jesus is really elevating the believers to a very high state status, a very high status in the relationship with God. Um, And this is really an important thing. It's an important thing. Again, we get it because it's just a part of our identity. But um, for them, this is all new. This is brand new. This is incredibly new. Um, and And that God is actually choosing them. That God is actively, proactively choosing. And this is another thing I think that um, that we miss, is that when God shows up in the Old Testament, God shows up in the Old Testament to punish, okay? Um, it's particularly later in the Old Testament. Once we get the manna and the Ten Commandments, um, then then God shows up only to punish. When God shows up, people people. They fret, they fear. Uh, But this is God showing up, not in a negative way, not in a punitive way, but God showing up in a positive way, in a loving, connecting way. So this is God showing up to do the positive stuff again. And this is very foreign for the disciples. It's very foreign for the people because God only showed up when spankings needed to happen. Uh, But that's not it. That's not it. That's not what we're getting here. We're getting positive. All are mine, all, all of mine. All mine are yours, yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. So Jesus is like, look, I'm, I'm checking out here. I'm not in the world anymore. I can't protect them, uh, but I don't want to see them fall apart. I don't want to see them lost. So protect them in your name. Protect them. Do what you need to do to protect them. Watch over them. I'm giving them back over to you in order to make sure that you take care of things. All right. So protect them. I'm not, I don't want to leave them alone. Now the advocate's going to come, but they need your protection. Watch over them because it's a really, really difficult world. So protect them. Um, so we go on verse 12. While I was with them, I protected them. In your name that you gave me, I guarded them and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you. I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world. Just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I am asking you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. All right. So Jesus is like, look, as long as I've been here, I protected them. I watched over them. I guarded them. The devil didn't get his hands on any of them except the one that it was destined to happen. And that would be Judas. Judas is the one to whom it was destined to happen. And remember what I said before, you know, this had to happen. Nobody knew who Jesus was, so they needed somebody to betray him. All right. So that was Judas. So while I was with them, I protected them in your name that you've given me. I guarded them and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. So in all this time, in all this turmoil and all this struggle, I didn't lose a one. I didn't lose any of them. They all remained except for the one whom it was already destined for this to happen, except for the one that was supposed to be lost. And he was supposed to be lost so that the scriptures could be fulfilled, so that the son of man could be betrayed into the hands of sinners. I guarded them. Not one of them was lost, but now I'm coming to you. Now I'm leaving this world. Now my time is done. My glory is going to be revealed. My journey is over. And since I'm coming to you, I speak all these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete um, in themselves so that they're going to know the relationship that they have with you. Like I know the relationship that I have with you. Their complete joy is knowing the relationship that they have in Jesus, in, in God through Jesus Christ. So, you know, protect them. And reveal to them so that their joy may be complete like 
our joy is complete so that they may know what it means to know you like I know you and they can know you like they know me intimately, personally. That is what um, that is what Jesus is asking. Jesus is asking that the disciples know God personally and intimately. That's the joy. I've given them your word and the world hated them because they do not belong to the world. Again, and this is, we've talked about this before, you know, Jesus, um, is not of the world. He is separate. Um, the disciples, as they start following Jesus, they're not of the world either. They're not part of the world's work. They're part of God's work, part of God's kingdom, but they're not part of the world. And because they're not part of the world, they don't have this stake in the world and the world doesn't like them because they're calling for change. They're calling for change. They're calling for something different. The world doesn't like that. So Jesus says, look, they're not in the world. The world's going to hate them on my, on my behalf. The world's going to hate them for my sake. So protect them, watch over them, sanctify them so that they can still do. And, and to be sanctified is to be, um, is to be anointed, is to be chosen to go out and do the work that needs to be done, even though it's going to be awful. Okay, even though it's going to be tough, it's going to be tough, but still sanctify them so that they can go out and do the work that they need to do. Don't let their um, don't let their persecution, don't let their struggle, don't let how the world treats them, keep them from doing what they're called to do, doing what they're supposed to do. Protect them from the evil one. They don't belong to the world just as I don't belong to the world. So they're in it, but not of it. All right. They're doing the work of God in the world, but they're not, they don't belong to the world. They belong to God. They belong to Christ. They've been turned over to the maker. They've been turned over to God. So they don't belong to the world anymore. So since that is the case, God protect them, watch over them, be with them, care for them so that they're not lost because if they're lost, then the mission is lost. I mean, Jesus has, God has asked this small band of disciples to take the word out into the world. So if they get lost, the mission is lost. So protect them, watch over them, watch over them so that they're not lost in the world. Watch over them so that they're not lost and that they're, and that it's, and that people aren't giving up on them. Watch over them as you have watched over me, as I've watched over them and you've watched over me, watch over them. That's, that's what you, you know, sanctify them in truth. So that they can hold on to the truth, even when there's persecution, even when there's fear and pain and loss. You know, that's the thing. You know, we can endure so much when we know that that endurance is for something powerful. Um, And the truth of God's word is powerful. So endure um, for the sake of the truth. Endure for, for, uh, for God's word. That's what Jesus is saying. Sanctify them so that they will endure for, um, for, for God's kingdom, for your kingdom. Um, and it's a hard thing. I mean, it really is, it, you know, being one who a- is asked to publicly preach. Sometimes it's just, sometimes I say things I don't, I don't, I don't treasure saying, but need to be said. And I ask God to sanctify me, to give me the strength to say it so that I won't back down and I won't ignore the words that need to be said because I'm afraid that people are going to respond negatively. And that's a hard place to be. It really, truly is. Um, for anybody who hasn't experienced it, it really, truly is a hard place to be. So so Jesus is saying, you know, and, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself, you know, sanctify them. They're not in the world, but they're, they're not of the world, but they're in the world. Take care of them because I'm not in the world. I'm leaving. I need you to watch over them. I need you to, um, you know, I need you to care for them. And that's where Jesus is at. All right. So I'm going to leave it here because there's, a, there's a lot more to this, but I don't want to jump into another big thought session. So um, I'm going to leave it here. I, I thank you again for being part of this. As always, my contact information will come up at the end of this, at the end of the session. If you have any questions or thoughts, you want to reach out to me, please feel free to do so. Uh, again, share it out there, um, connect it, get it out there for others to engage in love for that so that people can see and hear what we're doing. And they can know the love of the life, death and resur- the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As always, my friends, thank you. God bless you. We'll talk to you next week.